Hi folks, welcome to the MBA Jam. This is your host and founder Avinash here. This is the first time I'm trying out video recording. So in case you guys are seeing video of me and John, hello. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Today I'm talking to someone who has not only done MBA, but he's also someone who talks about MBA all day long. So today, hopefully, you'll get a perspective, not just on how MBA contributed to John's own career, but you'll also get to hear what motivated him to make MBA a central theme of his current career. Today, we're talking to John Cousins. John is currently the CEO of MBA ASAP, or MBA as soon as possible. <laughs> um, yep, any of those. <laughs> MBA ASAP helps you learn skill sets that makes you more valuable at your job. It helps you start something on the side or it also lets you quit your job and start your own business. In fact, John has been running his own podcast and YouTube channel with the same name of MBA ASAP and blogs at mba-asap.com. John has been running this business for three plus years. We'll find out more about John's motivation and experience later in the show. Besides that, John is also a professor at the uni at University of New Mexico, teaching new venture strategies and managing and operating growing businesses. From what I can gather, John is also an intriguing pianist. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and has also published books on a wide variety of business subjects, history, literature, and music. John has done his MBA from Wharton after studying electronics from MIT and music and media production from Boston University. So some strong caliber of educational institutions there. John, welcome to the show. Thanks, Avanish. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. No worries at all. Yeah, you go on. You were able to say something. Oh no, I was just wondering uh, where where would be the best place to start? Maybe with some of my my history and how I came to my MBA or something. Or yeah, absolutely, or absolutely. I think I'm, I'm liking this video recording because you know I can actually see when you might be wanting to say something as opposed to audio I've been doing so far. So yeah, I think I think that would be a great um, start uh, as to how you got to where you have come and uh, how you, you think an MBA contributed towards your um, journey so far. That's great. Yeah, the, the MBA, and that's, that's, that is important what you, what you say. Uh, the video adds an extra level of queuing, and so you can see each other. And Right, if I go, and you know I wanted to say something. <laughs> the, uh, well, let's see. I started, um, it, well, my history is uh, I went to, and thanks for that introduction, to uh, I lived in Boston. I actually grew up in New Jersey in the suburbs and uh, would travel into New York City from time to time and, you know, thought that that was I would go there for concerts mostly and things when I was in high school, you know, and uh, it just seemed too big and too overwhelming. But uh, then almost uh, I didn't know enough. You know, when you're in high school, that's your whole life. You know, you're circumscribed by all the things that happen in high school. And once I. Uh, uh, I, I made the decision to go to Boston. It was a lucky one, but it was just the right size city for me. It was a place where there was a lot going on, but it was easy to get around. And uh, there was tons of, there's like 500 college institutions and about a half a million students of that age. And so everything sort of catered to that age range. And I just, I ate it up. And I started out in mechanical engineering at Northeastern University, thinking a very practical career. I'm going to be a mechanical engineer, you know. And uh, I, I decided I was really going to be studious. You know, high school was great, but now I'm going to buckle down. And I did very, very well. I got, you know, straight A's and really did it. And then I, they had a work-study program there, and I ended up uh, – taking a semester and working for a company that manufactured bellows, these expandable things. And their whole thing was that they would be linear over their range. So they would, they were used in fighter craft and for medicines to, you know, put them out in a, in a linear fashion. And, uh, and oh my gosh, it was just, uh, I don't mean to trash them, but it was just a boring job, you know, and I just <laughs> like, oh my God, I don't want to do this. So I reconsidered back then, you know, uh, after two years of college, and I uh, decided to transfer to Boston University and to study literature. I was going to study English literature. And I thought, you know, I could now read the great books and ponder things under a tree, you know, and read poetry and just sort of – and uh, and my father was not happy at all. And he said, you, you know, you Most need to get – <laughs> right. You know, the parents are, you know, you need to, and I understand that now, you know, and I understood it then, but you know, you, you need to have a practical education where you can get a job and all this. And he, 
And I said, but dad, you have your degree in English literature. And so I said, well, yeah. <laughs> so he understood, right? <laughs> right. But, and, uh, and so I, you know, I understood that. And I've always thought of, there's two parts, you know, t- to education. One is the practical aspect where you get this training for a job and a career and to make your life, you know, uh, better in those ways. And the other part of education, and I think it's dismissed a lot these days, is that it, just for its own good, for its own sake, to study music and literature and art and and to really and philosophy and history and to understand how we got here, who we are, and and things that aren't necessarily going to, you know, you can get a, a, a bachelor's of philosophy and it'd be tough to maybe to get a job, but you know. But you'll know more about yourself. And the worthy aspects of that type of education, I think, sometimes get dismissed as we try to get on our, our path to um, getting better with skill sets that are actually pragmatically applicable. The, uh, in the olden days, there were the, the philosophers that were called sophists, and they would travel from town to town, and they would train the aristocrats and all in these type of skills of how to debate and how to argue and rhetoric and, and all the type of skills that someone would need to become a successful, you know, person. And, and they actually did a, I think they did a benefit. That was a good part of, of education, but they, sophistry has become a sort of a pejorative word where we think of sophistry as bad education or cynical just to do it, just to get a job. And and in a way, we've become sophists more. You know, we 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 uh, we look at well, should I go to school to learn how to computer program or to be a lawyer or a doctor? Or all these kind of professional careers or MBA, right? And so I decided I was just going to do that. And uh, and then I realized, oh, this is kind of overwhelming. All the reading I have to do. So I decided I am just going to. Uh, um, Take the courses that I think are the best courses with the best professors, the people that people uh, that other people talk about, and I'll cobble together an independent major out of that. And that's what I ended up doing. And then I ended up over at MIT at a night program. I while I was going to Boston University, I kept trying to get a job. I was very interested in music. I just loved rock and roll and popular music. And uh, I got I finally finagled myself into a job at. Uh, this place called ARP, A-R-P. They made music synthesizers. It was Moog and ARP made the original music synthesizers back in the 70s. And they were on all the big records, you know, The Who and Stevie Wonder and all these people were using these synthesizers. And ARP was one of the big companies. And I lucked into this job. And while I was there, one of the guys, I, I took a semester off because once I got this job, I wanted to stay there. One of the guys there was uh, enrolled in a program at MIT that was retraining uh, 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 electrical engineers that had been uh, trained back when tubes were the thing. You know, if, now you see if tube amplifiers and all those kind of things are, are still uh, uh, valued for uh, audio amps or for guitar amps and stuff because they distort neatly. But back in the day, everything was tubes. And then suddenly everything became semiconductors and transistors. And so these guys didn't know that kind of electronics. So they had to reschool themselves and they had a program over there to do that. And it was at night, and it was a really good program. It was called the Lowell Institute School. It was this, the Lowell Foundation had put this school together within MIT. And so I started taking those courses. And then when I left that job, I went back to BU during the day, and then I kept doing that MIT program at night. And in 1979, I've graduated from both. So I had this electrical engineering degree and a, and a degree that I put together called uh, Media stu- electronic music and media studies. And it was all advertising and radio and all these things. And I had been working in recording studios. I went down to New York then and got a job in a big record uh, uh, recording studio called The Record Plant. Making all, They were making all the great rock and roll records. Bruce Springsteen had just done Born to Run there. And Aerosmith was there. And David Bowie and The Talking Heads and Blondie and all these bands. And suddenly New York really became exciting to me. Yeah, so that must be that must be like the time of your life because you you were actually doing what you envisioned you might be doing and having fun at the same time. Exactly, and I loved that. And then from there, I uh, I started. I also had this electronic side, which all of it was based on electronics. It was all recording and equalizers and audio. And and uh, then I got a job with a company called Ampex, which is out of Silicon Valley, Redwood City, and they made all of the professional recording gear at that time. All the 
for all the recording studios. And then they also made all the video gear. So they, they schooled me up in how in the video gear of the time and, uh, and all the, the networks were based in New York. So I started working at the recording studios and at the, at the television networks. And, um, at that time, the networks would poach Ampex for their engineers as they tra- they'd let them train them up and then they'd hire them away for, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to work there. Just, you know, just like they do nowadays with, uh, Software and so engineers. I, that, that's what happened. Yeah, exactly. That's what happened. I went over there and I, I went to ABC and I, I, uh, fixed they had a studio where they were syncing up audio and video and doing post-production and, uh, they had a machine that was a computer that would match up the audio machines with the video machines and, and, uh, they, they, it was broken and I, Lucked, luckily fixed it very quickly, you know, and uh, it was really luck, but I made it look like, oh, yeah, nothing. I know all this stuff, right? How, how much so of that they, is actually helping you right now with this whole podcasting and the whole setup? I mean, your, your well, setup you know, looks a lot more professional, of course. <laughs> it, it's like these things come full circle, yeah. you know, and now it's all it's all that kind of stuff once again, you know, using uh, uh, videos to do the online courses, using the audio uh, recording and uh, editing to do the podcast and the, and the audio books for Audible. And, uh, you know, uh, so all these things come. And then on the side, I do uh, music. And uh, like you say, I'm a pian- pianist and a guitar player. And so I make records and they're available on iTunes and all back then. I mean, now it's a wonderful time because back then there were all these gatekeepers. You, if you were going to mm. go in a re- recording studio to make a record, a recording studio costs millions of dollars to put together back then, literally. Yeah. And now it's all dematerialized into your computer and you can get Audible or GarageBand, any of these kind of things for you know uh, $10 or something. And suddenly you have a complete recording studio in your, in your computer. And same thing with video. Video editing, forget it. It was hugely expensive. And now it's all in your computer. We have these little mics. They're USB. We have, uh, you know, video cameras everywhere on our phones, on our tablets, you know. So, and there's no more gatekeepers. So this is a wonderful time. We can access all these tools and use them. It's like my dream world that I couldn't even have dreamed of back then is now available. So it's amazing. And uh, so then I I, I worked for ABC for about 10 years doing... uh, uh, the the uh, engineering, uh, designing and building facilities for the network, and through that process, I was uh, involved with a bunch of people that you know my clients were news and sports, and especially sports wanted to and, and news too were always driving the technology. They wanted to have new ways to put the title under the uh, you mm. know graphics things under the, the or you know uh, handheld cameras and ways to uh, you know uh, put a little camera on a bobsled, all kinds of stuff. And I would work with companies to do that. And so after a while, I realized you know gosh. And then they would make these cool devices, and then they'd sell a, a gazillion of them. And I thought that's what I want to do is make companies where I'm you know pushing the state of the art, making technical you know type of things and then selling them. And I realized I didn't know anything about business. I remember looking at an AB annual report from ABC and saying, I don't know how to read this. You know, I don't know the balance sheet, the income statement, all this stuff. What, what is it? And so I decided I wanted to get my, and I, I had always wanted to get my MBA, but like you say, I got caught in these fun careers and it's like, well, I'll put that on the side. And finally, it was about 10 years into working after my bachelor's that I thought I want to go do my MBA. I mean, why, and, why not, why not learn that on your own or why not, why not? Because that, that's the alternative option, right? Because you must be at a point of time in your career where you could go and start something and maybe figure your way out. Well, exactly. And, and that's, that's, that's the big question up front is, um, you can learn it on your own. And now we have much more tools to do that too. And I'll talk, you know, I'd love to talk more about that. And MBA SAP is one of those tool sets, but there's also all these MOOCs, the massively open online courses like Coursera and edX and fabulous Ivy league type of, uh, you know, and, and other, you know, Stanford, all these places have these great programs that are online for free. And so now it's even easier, but back then you could have read the textbooks. And I thought about that. I tried that a little bit, but I, I felt that I needed the discipline, you know, just to accelerate the learning and have the mentorship and have the, you know, that here's the classes, they're all programmed out and you do them. So I was working in ABC and I thought, well, I could go to Columbia or NYU, you know, here in New York, go at night. They had night programs. ABC would pay for it. And that's a, the reasonable, sober kind of way, right? But at that time, uh, I was married. I had a two-year-old 
And um, well, actually, a one year old could say the year before is when I started to apply, right? And uh, yeah. realized that, gosh, you know, if I if I'm working all day and this it was a a challenging job, I would have put in big hours and then go to school at night and then do my homework on the weekends. I'll have no time for a family, you know, mm. and, and I'll be exhausted too. And I won't really give this education the, the time it needs. And I also was ready for a break. I was kind of burnt out, you know, working 10 years. I, you know, I, I was at Olympics and political conventions and space shuttle launches and Indy 500s and everything, you know, and, uh, and it was big hours and big pressure. And I thought, you know, I'd like to take a break for two years and just sit and read and learn and, uh, and take stock of where I am and have it as a, as a time to, you know, codify what I, my experience I've done so far, learn some new skills and then plan a, you know, a new future. So taking off the time for two years seemed very attractive, you know, to just, and I would just apply myself just to that. I wouldn't have to work and have all those distractions, you know, to my studies. So I thought, well, I'd like to, I'd like to just do my MBA just like that. If I'm yeah. going to do it, I'm going to do it full time and that's it. Absolutely. No, I, I think I, th- I think I really like the perspective. And I think the theme carries on from what you said earlier. Like you're not someone who is going f- to for the education in order to have a purpose or well, there is a purpose, but in order to just have a milestone or have like a dead objective, you actually wanted to experience the whole, um, you know, aspect of educating yourself. Now, that is not very common, right? Because a lot of the times from what even I've speak, spoken to a lot of people, a lot of them do MBA because they think they have to and because they think it gets them from step one to step two of the career and in terms of leadership skills or in terms of even the job options. For you, I can see the perspective is actually very different. Yeah, that that uh, and, and, and also I, I did want to, you know, uh, bolster my career certainly and all and uh but yeah i think that sometimes right it's just another step we punch the clock you have to punch the you know check off this box you've worked for a while you're going to do the mba now now you're ready to take on the next level of things and a lot of the people that i ended up going to school with i think they had that uh type of idea that they you know back back then and to this day the big careers were you went into consulting or you went into investment banking those are the two things, you know, you'd end up at McKinsey or Bain or Boston Consulting Group or at Goldman Sachs or, you know, those kind of places. And and then you would work your way up the ladder from there and uh, and you'd have a career. And that's a good way to do it. But once again, I I really I, I, I was a, a budding entrepreneur at that time before this whole, you know, now it's like, oh, gosh, it's a whole nother thing because now we have this history of the last 20 years of entrepreneurs from Steve Jobs and even, you know, Hewlett and Packard and then Steve Jobs and the Intel guys. And now, you know, Zuckerberg and, you know, everybody else that, you know, Elon Musk and these guys that have been just, you know, killing it with these great careers where they've made lots of stuff because now we have the technology to make things quickly and we can get startup funding and all that. But that that's the kind of thing that I wanted to do more was have a self-directed career and really try to make an impact in some way, um, and not take a traditional not take a traditional career as much. So, when I decided on Wharton, it's the only school I applied to. You know, I, I thought about Harvard. I wanted. I also thought if I'm going to do this, I want to go to a prestigious school because I want to yeah. make sure that if there is some sort of secret code or secret handshake or secret language that you have to learn, I want to make sure I learn it, you know, and if it's, if it's the, the contacts that you make and all that kind of, you know, uh, I want to make sure that, you know, there was, I was interested in that. I didn't want to leave that, um, uh, unknown and later on think, you know, gee, I should have maybe done that. So it's like, I'm going to go to one of the top schools or, or do it myself, you know? Yeah. And so I, I mean, Columbia applied- and NYU also were like, Quite reputable oh, absolutely. universities. Absolutely. They're, they're great schools too. Yeah. So when I was thinking about that and, and they have night programs and that was the thing, but, but Harvard, Wharton, they don't have, they just are two year things. There's no night programs, none of that kind of stuff. Now they have ones where they do executive MBA and you can do it on the weekends and things, but the most is the, you know, the, the, the full-time two year program. And so, uh, I applied to Wharton, you know, Harvard was more, is the case study method where you read case studies and then write about those case studies and that's sort of their pedagogical approach which is a great one 
But Wharton was known at the time, and I think it still is, as the the quant jock place, you know, where where quantitative people go. Mm. Um, So engineering, math people, stats people, you know, uh, spreadsheet people, uh, those kind of people, Wharton was the place because it was primarily finance was the strong thing and all this quantitative stuff. So uh, I ended up uh, applying there and, you know, and that's a whole process in and of itself too, is the application. And I decided I took a uh, Stanley uh, what's it called? Uh, course to apply, you know, to prepare for the GMAT because I really wanted to make sure that I got good grades on the on the. Uh, hmm. So I took a, a course eight eight Saturdays where I'd sit there all day, you know, and we'd study the test. And I think that really helped because then when I got into the test, I knew what the different uh, parts were, and so I didn't have to spend too much time reading the directions. I knew what it was. I could dive right in and uh, had some good study skills on there. So I did well on the GMATs. And I think that's an important thing to do. And I got very, very good uh, recommendation letters from some top people. And uh, so got into, you know, went to Wharton and uh, loved that. You know, it was a uh, it was a wonderful experience. Moved to Philadelphia for two years. And my wife at the time went kicking and screaming. She did not want to leave New York, you know, <laughs> and uh and and but we went there and it, but it was a big sacrifice. And that's that's the where the big weight is. You know, it's like, should you have take, you know, do the four years at night, which is twice as long and have no life for that time, but have someone pay for it or do it in two years, concentrate on it, focus on it. But then that's a big hole, you know, because you have not only the tuition, but I had all the expenses of, of a young family um, and you're not working for that time. So you're forgoing the opportunity costs become huge because you're losing two years of salary and you have all of these exp- living expenses and you have the tuition and everything else expenses. So, I mean, you end up digging a three hundred to five hundred thousand dollar hole for yourself. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. To, absolutely. You know, so taking, how. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, how, how, how did you go from, you know, literature to music to, to uh, choosing a school that's more focused on finance and quant? So the focus on finance and quant, was it was it because you said, look, that's the missing gap for me and I want to fill it with the kind of a business knowledge and education or or was it to strengthen your own skills which you had somehow gained over time? Well, it was both. I, I, I thought it was the piece that I needed to fit in so that I could take my technology background and then build companies and build uh, products and services around technology that 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 then I could sell. And so I was seeing all these technology companies like Ampex, like Intel, like Hewlett Packard, all these ones that were at, you know coming up at that time and thinking I'd like to do so, you know, something smaller than that modest but where I could build some widget and then sell it and I need to know about business in order to do that. And so that's what it was to fill in that skill set and I wanted to, you know, if I was going to do it, I wanted to do it at a place that also uh, was rigorous and at the top of, you know, where I could really compete at the top of my game and see if I could do that and all. And uh, and so it was for all those reasons that it, it seemed like a good choice. But it was also, you know, looking back and even at the time, the opportunity cost. Then you have this big, you know, you didn't work for that time. You, your career has been stalled, but you have this new poten- potentials that come out. And uh, but then, how do you make up that amount of money that you've foregone over over time? And so that's that's the big that's one big big issue with it. And uh, so yeah, so the 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 courses themselves were fantastic. Um, how how so so students go, were great. To go back a couple of steps uh, on yeah. the GMAT, I think that's that's where I would find really interesting. Uh, how old were you when you went into the MBA to try and get an assessment of how many years it was before you had left education? Yeah, I well, I graduated college in 79, right, 1979, and moved to New York and started Wharton in 88. Okay, so, so it, it was, was like nine, nine years. years since you yeah. left. So how... How did you find the whole aspect of trying to be a student again and studying for the GMAT? I found it really challenging and I was just like three years or four years since I left university. But I think that's one of the biggest challenges, isn't it, the GMAT? Um, uh, Looking back, I think that's actually one of the easiest things (laughs) to prepare for. But at that moment, it seems too big. So how was your experience in preparing yourself with an examination? Well, and that's a good point. Yeah, that's why I took a... uh... 
I took a course. I want to uh, Stanley Kaufman or whatever the you know it's the the, the regular you know I want to say Stanley Kubrick, but he was the director you know. But uh, yeah, um, it's been and, long. And, yeah, I, mean, took, I think I think a lot of them this, have moved on. Even even back when I was doing, I think so many institutions have lost hands. Have gone. <laughs> yeah, they might be gone. But uh, it was this thing where you sign you know because just for those reasons, I wanted to make sure that I studied for it, and I wanted to have somebody help me study for it because I I got the books you know learn the GMAT and all. And yeah. I read through them, but I, I couldn't really focus that much because I was working all day. And so I decided I'm going to take a course and just, you know, do it in that way. And it, it was really good because then you're sitting there and somebody's telling you what to do and you do it. And by the end, you get sort of polished up on it. And um, I, also I had taken a bunch of night courses. I took, I went to Columbia and took some computer science courses uh, just at night, I went to the new school, which is in New York and studied media studies in their master's degree program. Didn't finish those programs, but took, took courses in them. So I was, and I think I did some others too, but I was always a voracious, you know, I like studying. So I would take course just for the social aspect and for the intellectual, you know, uh, curiosity. Um, so I, I was never actually out of school and I read a lot and all. Um, mm -hmm. but actually when I, when I finally, when I went to, that that time I was in New York was also you know just a, a lot of fun time too because New York's just a fun place to to live and be. Um, but once I got into the you know once I got uh, accepted, boy, suddenly I started reading all these books and started thinking like, oh, I'm I got to prepare for you know this kind of thing. And uh, but yeah, the the studying for the GMAT was uh, I took that very seriously, and I think I think you have to. Um, not just wake up and take the, t like I did with the SATs when I was in high school, I just woke up, took the <laughs> test. And it's like, later I thought, you know, I should have studied for that. What was I doing? <laughs> so this time I was like, wait a minute, I'm going to study. And I was a, actually a mature student. Yeah, yeah. I was, you know, 10 years out. Um, it doesn't seem that much now, but it, you know, it, most of the, most of the MBA student, my, my colleagues were all, just three or four years out of out of school, you know, they worked for a little bit of time and they were on to their MBA. And so I was like one of the older students because um, I was almost thirty, you know, and uh, and that seemed like an old man at that time, you know. It's yeah. like, oh my gosh, you know? exactly. And, I, uh, I was one of the younger ones, <laughs> so I can really see the perspective on the other side. <laughs> yeah, and and uh, but I loved being back in school, you know, I, I wearing jeans every day, carrying a backpack with my books, you know, and and just, and I would treat it like. I really treated it very, I think, responsibly because I was a little older too, maybe, but uh, I treated it like it was a job. I would walk over there. I lived in Center City and I'd walk over the bridge to West Philly where, where Penn is, where Wharton is. And every morning I would walk over there about 8.30 and uh, I would stay till about 5.30 and then walk home, you know, and like, just like it was a job Monday through Friday. And I only had, you know, you only have classes maybe for an hour you know, one in the morning on Tuesday, one in the afternoon on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, you know, you don't have that many classes. So the rest of the time I spent in the library or spent in, you know, some in front of a computer or whatever. And I would just, and do my reading, do my assignments and just work and work and work and have a lunch, you know, and, uh, but just do it like that. So I, I would study a little bit at night, a little bit on the weekends, but pretty much, you know, nine to five Monday through Friday, do it. And a lot of my, you know, a lot of my, uh, colleagues you know they were more you know uh thursday afternoon was beer time and they had a pool place you know and they had all these great amenities that i really didn't take advantage of because i had a, i had a young child too but you know they would be out partying all weekend and you know playing pool and relax and and just show up for class or skip i never skipped one class i went to every single class i never missed a class and wow. um how does that feel i, I don't know I, you know I i i miss so many of them i feel bad i insisted <laughs> i'm gonna I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. like I'm going to treat it like a job. I'm going to treat it very seriously. And uh, yeah, and, and the other people, sometimes I'd be in class, I'd be like half the kid, half the students weren't there, you know, <laughs> and they'd be, you know, talking away. And, uh, and then when crunch time came, right, the last couple of weeks, everybody's pulling all nighters and they're all bleary eyed and they're doing these tests. And I didn't do any of that, you know, so I, I, I would, I went through consistently and I had my assignments done and be like, Oh man, I just, I, I was up for two days and this paper, uh, you know, and it's like, I didn't want to do it. Like jumping through hoops for somebody and saying, well, you want me to do a paper? Okay. Here's a 30 page paper. I just like did it while I was 
almost half asleep. All I wanted to do was go to sleep and I'm typing this thing. I really wanted to do something and I was proud of that. I actually explored and looked at the information and figured it all out and, and, and did it while I was like awake and, you know, and, 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 and curious about it. And so I, that's the way I approached it and did it. I think it was a really, uh, for me, very beneficial um, because again, I wasn't that interested in a lot of people too. It's the signaling aspect, right? It's like, I have this degree from Harvard yeah. or Wharton or whatever it is, and look what I've done, you know, and, and, and now that signaling is what they want. I actually wanted the content. The signaling was a great benefit, you know, but it wasn't about the degree. And especially if you're going to be an entrepreneur, um, at the end of the day, especially nowadays, it's even more of a, of a decision to do because what are you going to do? Convince yourself that you're a, a good prospect of, uh, to employ because you went to the school and have the, have that degree. Yeah. You know, if, if at the end of the day now the signaling aspect has diminished, I think, yep. and it's valuable in some traditional careers, but if you're going to be a computer coder and you're going to make the next Google or something, you don't, you just go and do it. You know, and so you can go and learn these things, especially now you can learn these different subjects online. And even afterwards, I thought a lot of it was like, you know, I could have a lot of the, what I learned there was pretty common sense. You know, I, you, you make something, you sell it for more than it costs you to make. That's your profit. You tell people about it and you make them aware of it and then you try to sell it and uh, and you try to make it for as less, you know, manage your costs and all. And it's like, duh, you know, there's not a lot. It's not it's not a lot of rocket science to it. You know, it's pretty much common sense across a lot of it, but then there are aspects like finance and accounting and those that are pretty rigorous. One thing I would have definitely have done if I had, had known was if I was going to do that, do that is uh, one, I would have, I would have read a little bit more ahead of time just to say, is this really for me? And I think I would have said yes, but I really would have put in the time. And I also definitely would have spent some time maybe taking an accounting class or, you know, so that, because that was the one subject when I got in there, they hit the ground running. I had never had any accounting before. And all of a sudden it was all this debits and credits and T accounts and all this stuff and all these terms. And that took me, I had a really scramble to, to get up to speed on that. Whereas like strategy or marketing or th those subjects kind of have some common sense and some intuition around it, management and leadership, you know. Everybody's seen some movies and see how people lead and you manage to tell people what to do and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's relatively more uh, related to everyday life where accounting is like its own world. And so I would definitely highly recommend anybody doing it. Take some time to really learn some accounting beforehand so that when you go in, you're not just going in totally cold, but you have some idea about what's going on. So you can so you can really uh not have that really super steep learning curve at the beginning. Cause I could imagine that could, it, it didn't, you know, uh, uh, uh crush me, but, uh, came close. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I think, I think you touched upon a really interesting point over there because the whole aspect of, of an MBA degree as a certificate, um, something that you can showcase, uh, that is kind of, uh, except some of the traditional businesses, uh, if you talk about some of the startup ecosystem, in fact, sometimes MBA is also considered like a disadvantage because you're perceived in a slightly different way uh, than how you might be perceived if you're hustling your way through to get there. So if you're doing it with that purpose in mind, then that's something that definitely needs to be questioned. But on the other hand, the interesting aspect, which I which I think you mentioned is that it actually is more relevant rather than less relevant if you're thinking about entrepreneurship because you should do it to educate yourself with you know some of the knowledge and some of the fundamentals uh, not necessarily to do it uh, to to show off or to showcase to to a prospective um, employer which is which is very interesting because on the other hand if you ask a lot of people um, they'll say no we want to start a business why do we want to do an mba because i think it's got a negative connotation because of the way it's grown and developed and organically moved along right Right. And it's got kind of codified into this institutionalized thing and w which is really can be good, but that it also has some, you know, downsides that we have to be aware of and to make sure that we navigate properly through it, you know, learn those skill sets and to make sure you can be so confident when you come out of that program that 
you don't have any holes in that education. You know all the different aspects and what the current thinking is and all. And then it becomes a lifetime thing too. It's not just once you do your MBA, okay, mm -hmm. I'm done. You know, I've done all my my work. It, it's a continual kind of reschooling and retooling and new books come out and new ideas come out and blue ocean strategy and, you know, originals and all these. And then all the, the, the people that are uh, actually running companies like Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, you know, there's always constantly updating what your knowledge is and expanding that base. I, I was a you know chief financial officer of publicly traded companies for 15 years. And uh, I have to tell you, when I came out of my MBA, I did not know enough about accounting and finance to jump into that role. You know, it took even while I was a CFO, you know, it took me a couple of years to start to realize, oh, now I get it. Now I understand. <laughs> and even get that big contextual picture about accounting and how financial statements go together and how they flow and, and how to do present value and do valuations of, you know, present value of discounted cash flows and new use net present value and all these things. It, it, it took me a while, too, to parse what was really important and what was more, you know, just details that might be important in situations but those situations are so rare what are the common situations what the core kind of things that i really needed to know to work every day and that's what i've tried to put together with mba asap it's like mm -hmm. so you know you can get it as soon as possible here's the 20 percent of the stuff that'll give you 80 percent of the results for people that are say a uh and an entrepreneur saying, I, I, I don't know how to code. I want to make this app. I don't have time to spend two years waiting on an MBA, but I need to know a little bit about business now so I can you know, do it and hopefully reduce my risk of failure and up my odds of success. And so that's the kind of stuff I'm providing now. It's like I, like I boiled it down into like from my experience, here's the stuff you really need to know. The other stuff's great to know, nice to know, yeah. but it might not be as applicable every single day. So here's the stuff that you need every day to just start charging forward and uh, and hopefully give people, you know, the and all, you know, that type of perspective. And also for people that are thinking about an MBA, you know, go and re, you know, look at these materials and say, is this really for me? And then if you do it, you've got a little bit of a, you know, a, a head start because you've sort of researched these already. So it's good to do as a pre thing for an MBA, and even afterwards, just as a uh, summary to say, what the heck did I learn in all these subjects? Because a lot of times, you're siloed in a marketing class, in a strategy yeah. class, in an accounting class. How does all this stuff go together? If you want to be a C level, you know, person in a company, you know, CEO, CFO, COO, CMO, CTO, CIO. There's all these C CXO, <laughs> yeah, CXO, all these things, right? If you want, you have to have a high perspective where you're using all those different aspects, you know, and every day in some assembling a mosaic of those things to address this, you know, these people do this is and because you're looking at the big picture and a lot of times in an MBA program, you just don't get that big picture perspective. So that's another thing that I try to do is like, and if you start with that context, one, you know, that context and you can look at all the stuff you have and assemble it and other also you, you have a context to slot all these details in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think, yeah. Absolutely. No, I think that's really, that's really interesting because that, that's one thing that gets me really um, a little upset with some of the universities as well, because I think even universities don't do a great job at bringing the pieces together. Like even the professors who come in, it's, it's not, sometimes it feels like they sometimes don't even have an idea what the other classes are going on. Um, so it's, it's very hard for them to bring together because they also bring in these silo pieces. And the whole job is left to the students to try and bring them together, which is which is not unreasonable as long as that expectation is set up front, <laughs> saying, look, we're going to bring in right. our own expertise and our experiences and insights. It's up to you to put them all together. Uh, and that's why I think the whole difference between having an experience um, a person going in to do an MBA makes a very big difference as opposed to someone who is just out of university because all of these learnings come from years and experience right it doesn't come just on its own but yeah that's that's really interesting uh point that you made one one point which i was really keen to get your insight especially was you know the the short term versus the long term benefits of doing an mba i think uh, i think you're the very first guest who has done mba quite a while ago uh, most of my guests uh, have done mba recently as a matter of perspective um, yes yeah, so what are your thoughts on you know the short term benefits as opposed to the long term gains of doing an mba 
Well, and that's a very good, a very good point. The, um, the, the long-term, I, the, I, I think the long-term benefits are, are really immense. Um, one of the things that's nice about an MBA is um, it's transferable. You know, you can go into the healthcare field and have an MBA. You, know, you can go into life sciences and have an MBA. And make it work. You can go into semiconductors or electronics or computer science and have an MBA, and it'll help that. So it, across a whole broad spectrum, you can go into nonprofit work. You can go into government. All of these different, just about every role you could think of will benefit from an MBA, from those that management at discipline and marketing perspective and accounting and understanding the numbers and all of those, you know, the decision tools, all of those things will help across your whole career and no matter where your career goes. So it's not specific and it, and it doesn't change. It's like a lot of these things, they've changed a bit. I mean, I did, I graduated in 1990, right? So these things have changed a bit and you keep up, but it's not like if you were a computer scientist or a physicist or an astronomer or something, how much the world has changed since 1990, you know, the, the computer world, you'd have to reschool yourself completely, you know, maybe eight or nine times during this time period where marketing is still, marketing has changed quite a bit now with digital marketing and mm. viral things and, and growth hacking and all, but other management, leadership, strategy, those are pretty timeless subjects. Accounting, accounting hasn't changed. You know, it's still gap accounting a little bit. You know, Sarbanes Oxley, some regulations, and you have, you know, FASB and I, you know, the International IS, IFSB, and so a little bit, but not that much. You know, finance hasn't changed. You know, time value money is still the time value money, except now we have negative interest rates, which no one talks about how the heck those work. You know, d does that mean you want to keep your receivables? You don't want to get them. You know, what does what do negative interest rates mean? And and so a lot, actually, a lot of the education has not kept up too with some of the developments, like negative interest rates. You don't hear them talked about in the economics classes. You don't hear them talked about in finance classes. You know, we have Bitcoin. We have a you know, new money kind of things. You know, blockchain, all kinds of stuff. So there are are new things too. And and by and the so, way, before so I, I think, by the way, before I forget, uh, it, it's really funny when I'm hearing you say this. I mean back in 1980s did you did you ever think that you'll talk about finance and accounting with such um, expertise <laughs> as as how much you're talking right now because coming from literature yeah. and music i mean it's like a completely different you know area for you yeah. right and it, it's taken years and years and years of thinking about it and studying it and 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 doing it and and doing it again and doing it again and <laughs> and uh, but yeah that so and i think that in in programs um, there's two ways that they have uh, professors in in pro like at UNM and things, um, where you have the PhD professors, and when you talk about siloed, they're very specific on their narrow thing that they that they mm -hmm. have studied. You know, when you when you do a PhD, you're very refined on a, on one thing, and that's what you're going to study. And they may have been academics their whole career, so they haven't really gone out and gotten beat up in the, you know, in the in the world of companies and you know juggling around and all so that's a good perspective but it's it has its limitations because they don't bring that experience of 20 years of work and so now they have the phrase it's a, the academics and what they call the pracademics like practical you know these people that come in like me i have an mba and a and a bunch of uh uh work experience and deliver that to the students where someone else that's a phd it may be teaching another subject or, or, or whatever, you know, they, they have a different perspective, which is mm. just as valid, just as valid, but different, you know? And so that's a balance too, especially in a field like an MBA, where if you're going into a field that's going to just be theory the whole time, like say you get a PhD in physics or, or in astronomy or, or whatever it's going to be like that, then having theorists and theoretical people teach you is a good idea. But if you're going to take all this theoretical knowledge that you learned in an MBA program and then just go jump into the shark tank, you know, of, of Wall Street or something, you know, you may have some problems because it's going to be a different environment that you weren't really schooled for in ways. Um, so that that's just a, another you know, that, that if you do an MBA, it's not the be all end all. You still have to surround it with all kinds of uh, practical kinds of education and things, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So so since um, just to understand the journey a little better, since the time you finished your MBA, um, 
you've done quite a lot of things now most recently you're doing mba asap um at, at this moment how did that concept come about and why did you decide to even explore this area of mba after so many years well uh, and it, it came basically i uh started and ran a bunch of companies and uh, and then about 10 years ago i also started teaching it was actually my sister started uh teaching finance at a university in New Jersey. And I thought, you know, that's really cool. You know, you're teaching. That's, I love that. I would do that. And so then the opportunity came along for me to start teaching. And so I started doing that. And I ended up uh, over the last decade uh, teaching just about, I've taught every aspect of business mm. from marketing to, you know, management, leadership, accounting, finance, startups, everything. And, uh, and as I was doing that, you know, and and seeing, and I really loved that. I enjoyed being with the students, the interaction, seeing the light bulbs go off where I'd say something that they they got, and I loved that. And I, and then I started thinking in my entrepreneurial way. Well, how can I scale this? You know, instead of mm -hmm. talking to 20, 20 students in a classroom, and and repeating myself every time, how can I, you know, scale this? So I started. I had had my PowerPoint slides, you know, my slide decks, and all. I started writing little articles off of that. And then I did a blog and then aggregated that up to books. And then now it's once again, these incredible tools, you know, you go to KDP, which is Kindle direct publishing part of Amazon. And you just upload your word processed files for your book and it becomes an ebook. And then they'll also print paperbacks on demand one at a time. So you don't have to buy a thousand paperbacks and hope you sell them. It's just how many people buy them. So there's no inventory costs or working capital. And so it sort of evolved as, oh, I can make a business. And then then I start marketing those things. And then mm. then uh, ACX is Audible, the Audible exchange, where if you record your book, you can put it up there and then it becomes an audio book as well. So now I got, you know, the blog and and the and the and the slide decks and put those on SlideShare. And then the uh, the, the the book, the the Kindle book and the and the paperback book and now the audio book. And then, well, heck, then I'll make a podcast because mm. that's a a doable thing now, right? It's it don't need a lot of material, you know, uh, to do it and to get it out. And the whole distribution network is there on our, you know, on our phone platforms and things. It's remarkable. And and then also doing taking all that and making online courses for Udemy and Teachable and these other platforms. And so then thinking, well, then I can point people in that direction with a nice sales funnel. And if I'm going to be teaching these courses. I should be walking the walk, right? And talk, you know, not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. Mm. I need to know if I put out advertising, is it really going to work? Or am I just like telling people stuff that doesn't work? So I wanted to create sales funnels and have conversions and have Google analytics and have my website and have my Twitter and my LinkedIn and everything sort of fold back into that, and my YouTube channel and have it all, this whole ecosystem kind of developed one out of my teaching and then out of let me prove up if what I teaching actually works. And just because now I can do it because there's all these great tools that are available for us for such little money. You know, if you have a word processor and a little microphone and, and a computer, you can do all these things. And you know, a Twitter account is free. A LinkedIn account is free. You know, all these, all these tools are out there. You, know, you can make a website for next to nothing, right? And knowing yeah. how to make a website is a great thing in and of itself. And so that's how it came about. And I have to say, it's really just exciting, and it puts me in touch with people like you. You know, this is the social aspects of it. Mm. Um, it's those one-on-one -on -one conversations instead of just blasting out a Twitter to twenty thousand people. That's good, but then when when you start to start to talk with them and all, and have relationships build up in those ways, and what I've been really amazed about is that all over the world, I have people that buy these things and talk to me, and they're in my email list and all, and all throughout India, throughout Africa, a lot in Ghana and these places and throughout the Middle East and Egypt and, you know, and, and, and in Turkey. And I just, and throughout Europe, through in, in England, uh, Australia, uh, Vietnam, you know, India is a huge, huge market, you know, because everybody speaks English. And so, and it's, MBA uh, and MBA is big. I mean, I mean, that, I I think I think that's really interesting. What yeah. what you're saying because I mean, I everybody started, needs these skills, you know. Exactly, exactly. And when if you're going to be a farmer, how do you get your stuff to you know? Or if you're <laughs> going to be a, a computer person, you know? Yeah. Absolutely, no, absolutely. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, interfere, but it, it got no. me really excited when you spoke about. Um, oh, good. The, <laughs> the, <laughs> the kind of audience where it comes from because. Um, 
when I started publishing the podcast, I started seeing people come from, I thought people are coming from India because I'm from India. And of course, when I'm spreading my the word out to LinkedIn and Twitter, they're coming from there. But then when I started to try and understand one-on-one, I understood that, no, these are not even people I know. These are just people who are organically finding out. And there are people who are listening in, in Africa, in in Middle East, um, which is very similar to what you're saying. I think it just comes down to there's a huge appetite. Uh, yeah. for something and like it's this. thrilling you know to to meet all these people from all over the world because everybody you know everybody has a smartphone right and and everybody has access to an internet connection or lots of people and we're going to have another billion come online in another year it's 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 really thrilling so yeah it's yeah, absolutely. That that is that is amazing. Uh, so so basically, uh, how it worked out for you, from what I understand, is you started getting into the academia um, to try and educate, and then this this is something that organically grew from there. How is right. the business aspect of that going? Is 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 this something that's um, generating enough money for you at the moment to keep it uh, to keep you sustainable on a business level as well, besides the social and the impact level? Well, I'd love to say yes that I'm a millionaire off of this, but no, <laughs> it's 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 uh, I, I make some money, and I can see that if I can, you know, I'm keeping the prices very low on stuff because I want to get it out to everybody. Um, but I still have to do other things, teach and consult, and those kind. Of, and I love doing those things too. But I could see a time, and it may take a couple of years or something like that. But I just enjoy doing it, so it's 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 not like. Um, you know, I have a horizon that I'm trying to meet. I just want to get this information out and and make some money. I mean, obviously, it's fun to make some money on it, and I'm doing it to to make money. And uh, but really, I I think when it will is when I populate the uh, my whole matrix of you know I had all those different uh, content things like ebooks and paperbacks and audiobooks and online courses, and then if you match that with marketing and finance and management and leadership, and then when you look at that, you have this matrix of maybe about a hundred products that I can populate, yeah. and if each one is making a little income stream, suddenly it becomes a significant diverse you know revenue stream that uh you know I, I i can see that it could it could uh be something that i could live on you know not now but you know in a, in, in a few years and in the meantime i'm just enjoying it and every sale i'm grateful for and every person that i interact with you know and it's lovely to get you know the comments when people say thanks i really enjoy this or that and you think that you know you're actually making a difference because uh at the end of the day that's the other part of this right is that these are skill sets that create one agency in people where people can be more independent they can do the things that they want to do they can have livelihoods they can take care of their family and two it makes economic development for their region if they make a, a good business and suddenly you know that helps wherever it is because uh, the the capitalist economic model has a lot of potential for people to rise out of poverty and 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 then make their dreams and visions come true. And so I think the MBA and the business skill sets are uh, the kind of things that can really enable people to to do those kind of to do those kind of things. So I think that it's really you know on a higher level, it's a way to make your dreams come true. Absolutely, and I think I think you're in the absolutely right track, right? Because you you have twenty three thousand plus Twitter followers. How did you do that? <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, well, you know, um, there are some ways to get Twitter going, and uh, and you can jumpstart it, and then um, there's some tools where I, I've made a bunch of. Uh, uh, posts that I do on a regular basis and things and, uh, mm -hmm. and then add posts and then, and then actually have direct conversations with people. Yeah. It's a, uh, and it also, it takes time. It grows over time. You know, you have to, I'm, I'm very active on Twitter. Yeah. At, at JJ cousins and very active. And I talk to lots of people on there and, uh, and, uh, same thing with LinkedIn. LinkedIn has been a huge thing, you know, again, worldwide, um, with with contacts, and I think I have close to nineteen thousand on on LinkedIn, and that's a, you know, that's a nice community. It's like wow, you know that. Um, and then the different clubs on there, like the finance club, there's mm. there's almost a million. It's like nine hundred and eighty thousand people in the finance club on LinkedIn. You know, and it's like, and there's other clubs too, but that one I I just 
have a wonderful relationship with and uh, they comment and like a lot of my posts and things. And, uh, and then I try to make a lot of stuff free too. I'll give a lot of free books away, you know, just smaller versions of my content so people can get a sample and, 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 and also YouTube videos and things where people can just go and watch and uh, they don't have to pay me and they can learn these things, you know, and if they want to learn it in a more systematic way, well then, you know, $25 for the course or $5 for the ebook or whatever it is, you know, and, uh, and then get that, you know, get the whole, yeah, oh, absolutely. No, it's, it's it's really inspiring because when when I started this, I I started this in order to may, maybe just to you know pay it forward or just to contribute uh, based on what I I'd, yeah. I'd learned. But as I'm doing this, I'm starting to understand that it is something that could potentially jumpstart uh, any business ventures. Uh, by creating some quality content so yeah i mean i i think we could chat offline in terms of um, uh, any tips i can gain from you on that <laughs> yeah and and then the people exactly the people you meet and and that know the type of content your interests and all um then that like you say it's a it's a network and you get to meet you know fun interesting people too through doing your podcast i know james altucher who has a giant podcast and he's really i, I listen to him all the time and I said, he said, it's a great excuse for me to, you know, approach people that are my heroes or my mentor, you know, the kind of people and then have a conversation with them because you get them on the, on a show. And so absolutely, you, know, they, you and I would have never connected it. if not for the podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And, and having this conversation is just a wonderful thing. You know, it's, it's great. And, uh, and it's great to have a new friend in, in London, you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in England. Absolutely great. So, I mean, usually I try to ask the guests as to, you know, uh, how else has an MBA contributed to to, to journey? I, I, have, I don't even need to ask you anymore because that's like coming out really relevant. I think one question which I might have is, I think MBA has served like a great building block for you in terms of how, how career has progressed for you. Looking back, uh, do you think, you could have actually done all of what you're doing right now if you wouldn't have done MBA. If you wouldn't have done MBA, what do you think you would have done? Well, you know, I think we all think about that a lot. You know, these these it, it's definitely for me it was a significant branching kind of thing, right? I either did this and all of those paths untaken. It's kind of hard to speculate. What if I would have stayed in Manhattan my whole career? And I know people that uh, have done, you know big jobs there and, 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 uh, all. And, uh, I moved out to Albuquerque and that was another thing that I moved to a place that uh, is sunny and wonderful, but not a big, you know, it's not Silicon Valley. It's not London. It's not New York, you know, Manhattan. And, um, and I love those cosmopolitan centers of power and all, but I also like, uh, being reclused from those to a degree so that I can live a, my quality of life is really good. And, you know, to me, and now with the internet, and with you know all of these other tools, I don't feel like uh, we're we're pretty much geographically independent. You know, lots of people live in urban environments. So I love that, but um, I still feel that I can be connected and engaged to the world at large um, and live anywhere. So that's been really, really fun. And I forget exactly what was the question because what I, I went off on <laughs> 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 how, how, what, what I would have done. I don't know what I would have yeah. done, but I know that um, that doing the MBA certainly enabled everything that I'm doing now. And actually having the prestigious MBA allowed me to teach because, you know, because I have a Wharton MBA, um, I think that allowed me, because I still needed that signaling mechanism to get into the universities to, to teach. And I think that has helped me as well. And it helped me to get the jobs along the way that gave me the experience to have something to talk about. So um, I, 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 at the end of the day, it was very worthwhile doing, but also very much of a struggle because because of that hole you know that that big hole you dig yourself into of the the tuition and not working for that amount of time and having your living expenses as well and then you come out of that and you have to you have to make that up but it's the same if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor or anything else um, the other thing about mba that i think is very important is in this day and age looking forward now um I think we're going to go through a huge disruption in careers in the next five to 10 years with artificial intelligence, robotics, you know, uh, machine learning, automation, um, a lot of the jobs, not just the jobs at the blue collar level, but doctors, lawyers, everything is going to be changed in those ways. Autonomous vehicles are going to, in the United States, 
the biggest job is truck driver. There's about 2.8 million truck drivers. Once autonomous vehicles come, those people are going to be out of work. Yeah, and augmented if, reality and virtual reality about doctors, as you mentioned, yeah. you know, it will do surgeries and operations from anywhere in the world. Oh, yeah. And they have those robotic Da Vinci machines now. And on the diagnostic side, Watson, the IBM, you know, into, uh, artificial intelligence, they're diagnosing disease states better than any doctor can because they can consume every case of this disease ever. All the articles that come out of all the journals right as soon as they come out and put, incorporate that all that all that way. And so we're going to go through a time where we're going to have to be more, I think, more independent. We're not going to be able to rely on a company to hire us when we're 20 and retire us when we're 65 and we'll have a career all through that. We're going to have maybe eight, nine careers during our lifespan or career. And, uh, and, and we're going to have to figure out what to do on our own in a lot of times, too, if we get laid off or something like that. And having these business skills give us that lifeboat and give us that ability to have have agency, have self-direction in our life, and those may be, become serious survival skills in the next decades. Yeah, absolutely. No, I completely agree. Uh, my wife has recently finished her MBA as well, and right now she's in the delicate position where she's not able to see the immediate benefits of doing an MBA. So she's like, what did I do it for? You know, I'm not really sure what I did it for. Uh, it's been seven years for me. So I'm saying, look, it, it's something that has to be, it's it's an education that amortizes, you know, o- over time that actually benefits Absolutely. and actually compounds um, over time. Because today I'm, I'm working in product management, but yesterday I was working in something else. And tomorrow I don't know what career I'll be working in, but one thing that remains consistent is the base layer that's formed with that kind of education and that base layer doesn't go anywhere. It, it's not something, it's it's not like, uh, you know, accounting or finance or, or law. Like if I don't practice, I'll forget. It's not like that. It, it's something that is always there at the back of your mind. <laughs> right. Those fundamentals aren't going to change. And that, that was the other thing, right, was... Uh, that people went into was besides uh, eye banking and consulting was uh, the, to be a product manager like at Procter and Gamble and those kind of things. That was the other big career path back. No, you're absolutely right. These things, and and she should think of it, and we all should think of it. It's a long term thing, and and life is not. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon, right? We have to think long term, and we're if you're going to be in it for the long haul, right? These skills. She, that's she's just like got the seed now, and then it's going to grow into a big plant, but it's going to take. It's going to take time, decades. You know, it'll take a lot of time, and you keep learning, and you keep using it in different aspects, and uh, and it and uh, and it's part of our self discovery, right? As we have these tools now that help us to discover who who we are more as we go through these different aspects of our life. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, John, coming coming uh, touching a little bit on the MBA ASAP. Uh, no. The listeners of this podcast, of course, are, you know, some of them are considering to do an MBA. Some of them are actually in that position where they don't know if they should do an MBA or they should focus on the immediate career path or they should do another master's course or maybe uh, something else that they want to do. So now this MBA ASAP, is, is that something that they can actually go and explore or they can actually go and try and experience and get some benefits out of it? Because I have a feeling something like this can actually help them make that decision better. Oh, good. Well, that, that's what I that's what I hope to do, actually. So they make a better, more enlightened decision. And yeah, there's uh, that they could look at my YouTube channel, which is MBA ASAP, um, or go to the website MBA-ASAP.com. And there's lots of materials on there. There's my blog on there. So there's lots of things to read. Um, my podcast uh, is MBA ASAP. Um, uh, on Udemy, I have a course. I'll be doing some more courses on there. It's a corporate finance course. And then on my website, and and then uh, at JJ Cousins is my Twitter. And on there, I just have a lot of uh, posts that you can click on any of them, and it'll take you to the book page. And I have a book page with about ten books, and they can you know read a lot of those. The, the books are two ninety nine to five ninety nine, and they're on every subject from. How do you write a patent to negotiations, management and leadership, learn accounting fast, corporate finance, uh, startups, a guide to entrepreneurship. I'm leaving out a few, but just all the different subjects. And hopefully I want to ultimately do 
all of them. So there's a well-rounded thing, but there's plenty of, uh, of things that people can explore and uh, for free, you know, go to the YouTube channel and read the blog posts. And also, uh, if you sign up for my uh, email list and right on the front page of the website, you just click, you can download three books. One is Understanding Financial Statements. So you understand what a balance sheet, a, a uh, cash flow and an income statement are. And I think that's absolutely key. So that's why I put that as a free download. And then one, it's a, one on uh, startups and entrepreneurship. And then one's a glossary of terms for uh, accounting and finance. So the kind, those kind, you get all those for free. And then once you're on the my email list, I send out lots of free material and videos and and uh, discounts on stuff and just all kinds of you know new blog posts, podcasts, everything. So that that's ways to get sort of into the quickly into the uh, the community. And yeah, uh, yeah. Hopefully that what it would be is like to test is is this for me? And then if you say yes, well, then you also go into the program with a little bit of knowledge, especially if you didn't study business undergrad and you're coming out of some other course, that's another nice thing. You can come from anything and get an MBA and then use it in that field. Um, and if you don't have those kind of core ideas and concepts about what the heck does finance mean? What is accounting? You know, it's good to get a quick overview. So when you start in day one, you have a little bit of an idea about what to expect. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It'll help your learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And, and and I can really vouch for the fact that John is really approachable. So uh, if you have any questions, um, you can always uh, contact him through any of these means. Um, yeah, please. Uh, we, we actually got uh, speaking like really quickly right after I approached you. Um, yeah, on LinkedIn. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, John, I've kept you for more than what I thought I would keep you for, which is which is uh, the, the quality of conversation. Uh, the one <laughs> the very last question I actually had for you is um, is there anything you wish I had asked you um, you know what I made a, uh, thinking about this over the last couple of weeks I made a bunch of notes to sort of like as I thought of oh I would like to say that I like to, you know I have my talking points and all and you know I think, I think, I think we've pretty much one, hit them I all think, I think you're <laughs> one of the you, I think you're the one the first and probably the only guest who has come prepared <laughs> as to what otherwise usually I'm the one jotting down questions so I really appreciate that oh thanks well I know and many times I've done you know just where it's like later on it's like Oh, I wish I would have said that. And so as I thought of things, I just like to write them down. Yeah. So and, is, there uh, anything, that's is there anything that you think um, that you would like to talk about? Anything that you think we missed out or any parting thoughts? Well, I would just say that this is a, a super exciting time to be alive. And we have all of these tools at our disposal that we can put to use for ourselves. And I encourage everybody to, to do that. And so one of the ways is to... I. I I, I wrote a blog post a while back and uh, where it was about if you, if you get the business skills and you get some coding skills and you can learn all about different computer things now online, there's free coding camp and even Harvard has that CS50, which is a wonderful computer science starting. You can learn how to code in Java and HTML and CSS and JavaScript and Python and PHP. And once you have those skills, you can actually do things with the computer. So if you had business skills and some computer skills, and then you have something that you love, whatever that is that you love doing, um, and one of the ways to find that out is what do you do when you when you're procrastinating when you're supposed to be doing something else the thing that you do that's probably what you should be doing because that's what you love doing you know and finding those those three things in like a triangle right you have those two support yeah. things the business skills and the computer skills and the thing that you love that can be that can be a career and right now there's no gatekeepers and everything it used to be if you wanted to get on the radio you'd have to be on a radio network right if you wanted to make a record you'd have to have a record company and have you know people put you in the recording studio and and it would take and then they'd have to make the records and put them in the stores now you just record something on your computer upload it to iTunes and away you know you're going away if you wanted to write a book before you'd have to have a book publisher and you'd have to have an editor and they'd have to write you know publish the book all these things were gatekeepers and expenses that kept us from being able to do these things those are no longer there so now we can actually do all these cool things and i think business schools and an mba is a great way to help us achieve those kind of things give us yeah. this, the tool the toolkit to do that whatever it is do that stuff Absolutely. I, I love your part on, you know, when you're procrastinating, what do you do? So for me at this moment, when I'm procrastinating, I actually start learning about sound engineering and <laughs> and sound oh, mixing and editing because of running a podcast. I would have never thought I, I, would, have, I, I would do that. So yeah, absolutely agreed with that. <laughs> and probably doing the MBA and all has given you more confidence that 
I can do a podcast. I can figure out how to do this, right? And, and that's another thing that it gives you is it gives you skills to break things down into doable chunks and say, I can do it and just march through those those things instead of being intimidated by the world. Absolutely. No, I completely agree. And and that's what I, I find a massive uh, difference in perspective between uh, me and, and some other people I, I come across. Um, uh, because MBA is not a very, not a very popular career option in, in Europe and UK, especially when you try to, uh, you know, go on, on a company or leadership uh, qualities. Uh, but I, what I find is a difference is, for example, if I wanted to start this podcast, I just got it started. Right. It, it gives it. you that confidence to, uh, like you said, to break it down into manageable pieces because you're like, this is this doesn't sound alien anymore. It sounds like something that's doable. So I think I completely agree. That's a very good change in mindset. Yeah. Cool. John, this has been absolutely fantastic talking to you. Uh, oh, I really gosh. appreciate your time. <laughs> really really appreciate it. your time. Thanks, it's, Anthony. It, no worries. No worries at all. Um, um, yeah, I have I have nothing else to ask you anymore. And, and for if at all, you know, if, if you guys have any questions for John, uh, please feel free to reach across to him on any of the channels. I'll list them all in the show notes as well. Uh, or if you have anything, please email me at avinas at mbajam.com and I'm more than happy to uh, pass across your reference to John, uh, uh, you know, so that you guys can have a conversation. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate it, Avinash. Thank you so much for having me on. No worries, John. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye.